Thank you, Ben. Now, for years, climate tech was touted as being immune to the usual economic cycles, or at the very least, it was heavily insulated from them. And yet this year, early stage investments are down in both number and size. Are investors fleeing or is something else at play? Are we about to turn a corner? Joining me today are Sophie, a general partner at Collaborative, Amy, a general partner at Azola Ventures, and Duncan, a general partner at SOSV. Now, since we last spoke, the Fed raised interest rates. Sophie, we'll start with you. Do you think that'll help open the floodgates after a tough first half of the year? Yeah, I think it definitely will help grease the wheels a little bit. Um, but there's such a long, uh, there's such a long um, gap between when these uh, events happen in the public markets and once they trickle down to the private markets. And I think we're still seeing some of the echoes of some of the big, um, big rate changes in the last year and some of the concerns around policy changes and all of that tends to to come on a bit of a delay. So um, hopefully hopefully it eases some of the concerns about the cost of capital, but I think there are a lot of other big macro stories at play. So it's certainly not going to be a, be a cure. Amy, Amy, are you seeing something similar on your end? Well, I would say one of the things um, that we're seeing because we generally are focused on overlooked and neglected solutions is that Aside from macroeconomic factors, which are playing a role, is that capital is actually funding specific climate verticals. And so transportation and energy have received a fair amount of investment, but other verticals like food and ag or the built environment have really been left out. And that's creating a vacuum, essentially, of these types of climate solutions being able to properly scale. Yeah. Duncan, you focus heavily on hardware. Are you seeing similar trends in the hardware space? So from the um, from the Fed perspective, you know, there's so many other factors, as Sophie kind of mentioned. We're so close to the election. I think that no matter what happened with interest rates, it's gonna we're going to be gated by people just wanting to know what's happening there. Not that it actually really changes anything, but certainly gives people a different view on the investments they're doing. Yeah, I've been investing in hardware for a very long time, for over 10 years now. And I would say that even though we're at a dip now from where a lot of investors came in at sort of around 2020, 2021, if you compare it to like pre-2018, we're up massively and there's, there's a load more um, investors coming in that are more prepared to take risks on hardware solutions because they know that's the only way to cover ice. Now, you said that bit about um, the election and how it's not really going to change anything. Um, can you elaborate on that, that a bit? Like, you know, obviously one administration would be very, um, I guess, heavily inclined toward action on climate and continuing policies similar to the Inflation Reduction Act and stuff like that. Um, obviously, the other one feels differently. So what makes you say that? Well, I don't think any of the climate investors are going to stop investing in climate technology because of a change in, in government in, in that case. Um, what I do think will happen, though, is that they'll, they'll just look at slightly, look at opportunities in a different way. Like we've seen a lot of the IRA support going towards, um, you know, a mix of different states. And you probably want to make sure that you're continuing to get investments that are kind of picks and shovels for some of those projects versus deprioritizing some of the other. But net net, is, is it going to reduce the amount of money that comes into climate tech? I don't think so. It, it's so interesting to me because we're, you know, less than a month out from climate week. And I, I heard so many of my peers kind of echoing Duncan's statements there. And I don't know that I disagree. I'm, I'm, I'm certainly no policy expert, but I guess having lived through the first Trump administration, I have a lot of fears about the gap between what is the rational move and what actual actually happens in reality. And I think the sentiment towards the IRA among particularly Trump Republicans is is so negative, particularly in, in the areas that receive the highest subsidies that I do have fears about what's going to happen if there's an administration change. Um, I think a lot of the jobs were created in red states, but I, I don't know if that's going to translate into actual um, policy. So I have I have fears about what's actually going to happen to to climate from a policy perspective. But I also think, you know, to your point earlier, Tim, a lot of the capital has a, a lot of the sort of tourist capital that came in in 2020, 2021 into climate has has left the market 
Um, and I agree, totally agree with Duncan. I think the dedicated climate investors are going to stick around regardless of what happens in, uh, in the administration. But I think we need generalist capital to, to make climate tech successful. I think we need to prove that these business models work for generalist funds, that they can achieve true VC outcomes. And I think a lot of the generalist funds are going to be be a lot more cautious if they don't feel like there are those those sort of macro tailwinds around climate, that there's not the support from um, non-dilutive capital like government grants available for these companies. So I definitely do have some concerns. I was going to say also, not to be uh, contrarian here, uh, but the climate-focused investors, yes. But even among some climate investors, I do see that there are people sitting on a fair amount of capital because they do want to see how the election is going to play out, particularly across different verticals. And, you know, climate tech isn't immune to some of the broader VC trends, and they're getting pressure from their LPs to make smart bets, especially because exits haven't been as common in our space. And so it actually makes me a bit sad to say that we're all in this together. And some of the people around the table thinking that we should be riding these tides have said, well, we kind of got to see how things play out, which as you know, an impact first investor in the climate space d- does actually worry me that that perception is also hitting some of our closest co-investors. Yeah, the point about exits, I think, is interesting, Amy. I know it's kind of the IPR m- m- market tends to be frozen for a lot of different sectors, not just within climate. Um, but where do you see once the window opens some of that opportunity and how might that spill over for early stage founders? It's a good question. Um, you know, I would say that climate tech investors, I think, and broader investors and those especially that will be acquiring a companies have tended to do that in particular sectors. Um, you know, we mentioned energy, transportation, things that have become pretty hypey. Um, are able to tell a very consistent narrative, I believe, for a lot of acquirers. You know, that said, I do think that there is sort of hidden corners of acquirers that a lot of VCs haven't thought about. Not all of them are corporate. There could be other types of organizations that are looking to get in the climate space. Um, you know, for example, not to be, a, you know, due to horn, but we actually had our first exit at um, Zola <laughs> last week. Um, less than three years after our initial investment, and we sold uh, heat. You know, it's a high temperature industrial heat pump company to a private equity firm. And now a lot of people would have said private equity firms, early stage climate tech, really. But there are a lot of them who are starting to think about strategic synergies with other portfolio companies that are focused on net zero solutions. And that made a lot of sense for us. So I also think that there are some sort of uncovering of non usual suspects. Um, that could be acquirers in the climate space. Now, I know, Amy, I'll come back to you again real quick. Um, You know, I know part of your fund's mandate is to find, you know, these, I guess, uncovered solutions, right? Ones that are not um, very popular in the market. Um, Do you also take that same approach to bringing investors into your syndicate where you're trying to draw in other investors and like, what does that process look like? And how do they then work with portfolio companies relative to what you do? Yeah, I would say that we care very deeply about building complementary syndicates. We consider ourselves to be very collaborative, just like um, Sophie and Cloud Fund and Duncan and SRC. Um, And we think that's the greatest sauce for actually helping these companies scale. And so, you know, if we are a deep climate focused investor around the table, but we don't have, you know, biotech expertise or there are other investors that have deep industrial expertise. If it's, you know, a technology that is focused on decarbonizing industrial processes or an investor that's in a geography that is going to be the ultimate end market for some of our technology solutions, we want to bring them in earlier rather than later because we think more diverse and complementary skill sets around the table are better than a lot of the same ones. Yeah. And Duncan, on the flip side of that, um, if we're talking about attracting people who wouldn't normally have been in climate, um, obviously the founders are another part of that equation. Um, And, you know, 
four or five years ago, maybe even two, three years ago, you started to see a lot of founders that might have gone into other sectors or, or into climate. Um, do you think the climate tech space is still attracting the best founders? I, I definitely think so. I think that's actually one of the parts. Well, there's there's a number of oh, right. um, this whole industry has resilience through whatever is going to happen um, in, in, in the coming years. Um, obviously, we've got a big challenge that we need to solve, and we're seeing some of the repercussions of that as we're recording right now um, in Florida. Um, but, you know, one of the um, the biggest um, pluses for me about um, about this market is that the brightest, youngest people are wanting to make a difference in this space. And so you just think about the huge amount of talent that's coming in from PhDs and postdocs. Everything that we see in the stuff that we support, where we give grants to a lot of these, um, you know, uh, academics um, to help them kind of commercialize their technology, and then we're often the first investor in, they are really just committed to having impact outside of a financial one for what they're doing. And that, that I don't think is going to go away. As more and more people come into the workforce, they start to see some of the problems that have been created by past generations, and there's a chance to fix it with technology. Sophie, are you seeing that on your end too? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think we are seeing kind of the best and brightest going into primarily climate and AI, are kind of the two big buckets. Uh, where we're seeing talent gravitate towards. A few years ago, it might have been crypto as well, but I, I don't know how many how many new crypto companies are starting uh, right now. Um, so yeah, I, I agree. That is, we look really long term at the category. Uh, that gives me a lot of optimism because, well, we want to be doing investing in, in the smartest people, and I do still see that, particularly young founders, really wanting to solve problems related to climate change. But on the flip side, because there are so many young people and talented and smart people that are focused on finding these solutions to address the climate crisis, I feel like climate burnout, I don't know for the two of you, Sophie and Duncan, for founders has been really real. Um, they already have the weight of trying to build a successful, you know, scalable, financially sustainable business, but then they also have this immense weight of trying to do something that can avert catastrophic climate change. And when we talk about the recent hurricanes, I've, I've found that a lot of founders are, that weight is actually becoming, in some ways, really challenging to bear. And so it's also interesting to think about how we as VCs um, not only nurture the talent that's in the space, but also make sure that they stick around and bring their incredible talents to help climate tech actually be successful. So are you finding your role as kind of emerging as a psychologist in this case to kind of like or therapist help help coach them through these moments? No, I do not have an MD or whatever is needed to be a psychologist or a therapist. Um, but I think that executive coaching and we've been collecting a lot of founder resources on like burnout and frankly, burnout specifically for those founders that are focusing on the climate um, tech space. And we think that that's helpful. And we've been introducing that sooner rather than later and connecting them, you know, with the right people that actually have that expertise, which is not me, um, to really support them through that journey. I think the best way that we we solve for burnout is we need a couple really big wins in climate. I think we need some big success stories that founders can look to as a model for what's possible for them. And um uh, yeah, just we, we we need a couple more more wins. I, I, I'm founders who gravitate towards climate tend to have some altruistic motives for it, but entre entrepreneurs in general, they you know want to build a successful business. That's why they they take all the risk and put in the the miserable hours to do it. And so um, I'm hopeful that in the next couple of years we're going to see some really really sizable climate companies either have big outcomes or just hit the scale that becomes an inspiration for a new wave of founders coming in. I, you know, climate tech isn't universally deep tech, but it is pretty heavily weighted in that direction. Duncan, do you see it um, maybe a little bit differently in the hard tech side of things where these things just take a long time to develop anyway? They do. Yeah. Yeah. So if you, you know, we've been investing in industrial tech um, for a very long time and the, 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 the iteration loop 
that you have classically in software, which you can do super quickly, it's just so much longer in hardware that means that in order to get the product market fit, in order to like pivot, takes you know sometimes over a year versus you know a couple of weeks that you can do in software. Um, that said, you know the nice thing about hard tech is once you're in, you're in. Like the the, the quality of revenue is much higher. Um, because you're infrastructurally bound to your customers and they're normally relying on you to create their end product. So you don't have churn issues like you did with, like you did with software. Um, that to me, um, sets forth a much better growth capital environment when that tap turns back on. Um, because a lot of these companies are not kind of like some of their software counterparts kind of fighting against churn other well-funded startups that are competing with a similar product they're already embedded in with their customers and it's more about how they look to non-dilutive capital to um to be able to uh, uh scale the technology that they've put in up so the non-dilutive capital thing i think is maybe an interesting part of this um how are you all coaching founders to chase after that at this point because if traditional investors are holding back for whatever reason presumably there are other pots of money out there that they could go after Amy, or what are you doing there? Yeah, so I think they're the more typical sources of non-dilutive capital government grants. And so, you know, we actually have people on our, our team and connect them with grant writers or key program managers at different agencies. I think there's also another form of non-dilutive capital, which often founders are less likely to go after, which is actually philanthropic uh, capital. So there are a number of philanthropists family offices and foundations who have started grant programs, sometimes public and sometimes on the on the fly or on the sly, um, where they're really looking to support climate tech uh, founders. And they can be quite flexible and also do it in a way that might have a shorter timeline, which can often, you know, work uh, better for founders. And so because, you know, our model, which sort of combines both traditional venture capital with philanthropic capital, we often try and connect them with those um, philanthropists and foundations to access that non-dilutive capital. Yeah. Do the, either of you, Amy, or sorry, Sophie or Duncan, um, kind of push founders in those directions as well? Yeah, for sure we do. And um, for me, it's been surprising actually, um, you know, now being based in the US, seeing quite how many of our climate tech founders finding non-dilutive grants from DOD and DOE. DOE is obvious, but DOD is why. One of the reasons for that is you know, the U.S. is going through this very interesting and forward-thinking strategy of you know, climate tech um, solutions that are built here, and then the, that built here part starts to be you know an industrial resilience um, play, which then also attracts separate pools of non-dilutive capital, um, which are great, and they're building a fantastic backbone for the future for America. Yeah, Sophie, are you guys doing similar things at Collaborative? Uh, in terms of, of uh, pushing companies to think about non-equity, definitely. Creative, I, I, yeah. Those three big buckets of sort of uh, grant capital, philanthropic money, and um, debt financing. We're pushing every team to start thinking about those and building muscles, um, building the muscle to to access those types of capital as early as possible. And doing that early as possible is the key, I think, like, as Sophie says. Like a lot of the hard tech, companies, um, they can build into the design of um, whatever they're going to be and, uh, taking to the to, to the world a way in which it's better financed for debt versus for equity. So, for example, making things more modular, thinking about kind of smaller wins that can get the TRL level much higher so that the more risk-adverse capital can be involved at the earliest stage. The other type, the other way to sort of de-risk your capital, it sort of touches on what Duncan was saying, but diversifying your customer base so um, looking to customers like the DOD, for instance, who can um, potentially be good catalytic um, uh, revenue for you before you can access really big corporations and um, scale up to the point where, where you know, you're getting sort of corporate revenue, um, you find that DOD comes in a lot earlier. So that sort of merging of climate and defense is it's very real right now. I think we've seen it only magnified in the last you know, 18 months or so. It, Sophie, I think you made an interesting point about debt financing. Um, how accessible is that, though, for early stage companies? Because a lot of times they have an idea, they have a few 
lab experiments. Um, what sorts of early stage companies do you really see debt financing work for? Because I'm guessing many of them would not be able to access it. Yeah, it, it it's definitely not an avenue for most companies up until the Series B or C. Um, and that's why I, I um, tried to be specific that it's not that we're pushing them to access that that type of um, capital. It's building the muscle to uh, be able to access it. Um, you know, there are certain types of debt financing that are available to companies a little bit earlier. I'm thinking equipment financing, for instance, and just getting into the habit and having team team members who are familiar with the steps necessary to access that, building the relationships you need to access that financing. I think those are very important, but um, you're absolutely right. Most seed stage companies should not be taking on any form of debt um, that's that's typically a very dangerous path to go down. Uh, I think the 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 former the first two types of capital, like um, grant and philanthropic capital, is is a little bit more accessible at those stages. Yeah. So I want to kind of focus on maybe moving forward and what it's going to take to get us out of this rut. I know exits obviously are a big one um, that would motivate a whole lot of players in this space, but obviously that's kind of the end goal, right? Um, are there kind of intermediate steps that you're suggesting to founders? Um, Duncan, maybe we can start with you. But I'm suggesting to founders or I'm suggesting to growth stage investors? <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe both, yeah. Because <laughs> it's really a trickle down effect, right? That's what's happening with the Series Cs and not really happening for the Series Bs, but that's then making the Series A investors, you know, a little more cautious and people are coming lower and lower down. So there's a great market at the moment for pre-seed and seed stage venture capital. Um, if you're a startup, there's there's there's, there's plenty of um, of VCs that are willing to take risk at that stage. Um, you know, for us, obviously, trying to I mean, building in this muscle bridge I've talking about earlier around ultimately getting to bankability in the future that's a, that's a long part, but building that in early is good. The grants, as we mentioned, do help because they can start to bridge to get people a little bit further. Um, where I've seen companies. Um, being able to leverage um, debt earlier than like a Series C um, is typically where you've got multiples of versus one big. So a very large plant, you don't want to go down that road. Robotics, where you've got lots of the same thing and it's just about scaling that one thing and it's been de-risked, that's, that's an avenue to go down. So I think getting founders to think about that, about how you can just de-risk a lot of those um, parts of your technology will help you get further without without the venture capital market being turned back on. That's all I can really do for the founders. Um, for the investors, yeah, we're at, I mean, Series Cs, I think, will come back. I keep saying that, though, every quarter. So <laughs> I've, I've yet to be proven right on that. Um, but it does seem like there's starting to be some activity there. Totally agree with Duncan um, on, on what he shared. And, you know, on the founder side, you know, I, I do believe that there's more of a focus necessary on customer traction in a real and tangible way. And so when we think about um, ARR metrics, really hitting the, you know, 1 million if you're kind of C to Series A and north of that 5 to 10 million is really critical, not relying on LOIs, which was sort of a thing of the past, which was a checkbox to get um, venture funding, you know, during the heydays of 2021 to 2022, but actually having real purchase orders, I think really scoping back down to the business fundamentals and be able, being able to show that commercial traction and those key milestones is really important for uh, climate tech founders. And I think trying to drill that down into founders as a VC investors, I think can be also extremely helpful. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm certainly not going to disagree that um, there's been a massive slowdown in capital deployed in climate. Um, I think that's obvious, and there are whole sectors that are practically graveyards right now, unfortunately. Um, but I would I would push back a little bit on it being quite as dire as everybody um, seem, seems to think. Uh, I think what's also happening, in addition to the slowdown, is kind of a reframing of what is climate. Um, and kind of a renaming of, of certain companies who don't maybe three years ago sort of wore the badge of honor, wore climate as a badge of honor, are now maybe shying away from being bucketed solely into climate. And so what I mean by that is we are seeing a ton of other tailwinds that intersect with climate, the sort of 
defense and climate uh, merger is is one of them. But we're also seeing a huge manufacturing revolution happening all over the place, but that's certainly uh, happening domestically. And the uh, necessity to create efficiency around those those new processes is very interlinked with climate. Um, AI is interlinked with climate. Um, consumer health is interlinked with climate. All of these different spaces where we are seeing a ton of momentum and a ton of interest are either interlinked or adjacent to climate in ways that I think are going to be really interesting. So I guess I would push both founders and growth stage investors to open the aperture a little bit and open their minds to what what qualifies as a climate company and um well, not not maybe pick so narrowly the categories that we were looking at back in 2020. Climate is everywhere, basically. Exactly. I mean, that's the dream. The dream is we end up in a place where none of us are climate investors because everything is climate and everyone is investing in climate. Yeah. Well, I think we have time for one final question. So let's say I'm a founder. How should I be preparing for fundraising in this market? And Sophie, we can start with you. Yeah, I mean, going back to what Duncan said, I think really having a path, credible path to building a fundamentally sound business. Now, obviously, that's very hard, particularly when you're um, dealing in in hardware to do in the short term. But we we do not exist in a world anymore where you can just build on, uh, you can just raise capital on a, a story after a story after a story. You really need a path to getting to a profitable business um, within the frame that that venture capitalists are looking time frame that venture capitalists are looking for. Um, so I would say really devote some resources to um, building out that model and being able to talk to it um, in pretty pretty great detail with your investors. Yeah, Duncan, what are you telling yours? Think, you know, climate as a North Star, but think about how that's built within the environment that you are. So within, within, within the walls, within the friendly countries, whatever it is that you're operating it in is going to give you a sustainable path to continuing to get, um, venture capital and other forms of investment. I don't think that trend is going to go away. Um, and so as long as you can show that there's kind of climate with industrial resilience, um, which goes back to again, what Sophie was saying around kind of the, the fence slash climate nexus. Um, I think you're in a very sustainable path to continue to grow your business with the right types of capital. I think you have to ignore some of the valuation metrics you used to get sort of during the COVID times, but who knows, they may come back at some point. Yeah. Yeah, Amy, I'll let you have the last word. I definitely agree with Duncan and Sophie in terms of, you know, what what they shared. I think a lot of the founders that end up pitching us because they're really on the earliest stages really focus on the technical um, aspects of their company and really focusing as well on the business aspects, like Sophie was mentioning, the really credible pathway to mer- commercialization is really key. You know, I would also throw something else in there about thoughtfully thinking about equity and justice. Um, that's become a really core focus of the Biden administration and across many climate verticals. But, you know, when you think about a couple of where it's really prevalent, like carbon removal, is being thoughtful about how you're going to be integrating equity and justice into your deployments. How are you thinking about responsible deployments? How are you engaging local communities where appropriate, especially as it relates, you know, to permitting um, has been a big bottleneck. And so we're also, you know, encouraging our founders to think about that early because they'll be much more prepared down the line when, you know, those questions rightfully um, will, will come up by customers and partners. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I think that's it. Amy, Duncan, Sophie, thank you so much for your time. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.